Good evening. Good afternoon. Hello there. Welcome to the Sacred Journey. The Sacred Journey is the program that reminds you that life is a wonderful adventure and each and every experience we have is a unique and perfect opportunity for learning. I'm really delighted to have someone that you may remember from say years ago on our show, Dr. Frank Aida. This show is called Is Cholesterol the Real Villain? And Dr. Aida, as a naturopathic physician, I know that you have a different insight into um, health issues. And I read yep. your ebook on this topic and I was fascinated and um, a bit surprised. So yeah. I'm going to just say that it's always so enlightening to have you on the show. And I thought it was past yes, time. That it, we I think it's, I, I was thinking, Joyce, when was the last time I was on here? And it must have been, I don't know, five, six years ago, that last time we we, we did a talk. So this is uh, At least. perfect timing. Yeah. So um, today I want to talk a little bit about cholesterol. And, you know, cholesterol is a huge topic. Um, I hear it, every, you know, everyone you know, when they go to their conventional doctor, conventional doctors love to look at cholesterol levels and, you know, basically gauge someone's health solely by their cholesterol level. If they have good cholesterol, you're in good health. If you have high cholesterol, you're in bad shape. There could be nothing further from the truth when you think about it, because cholesterol is just a simply one particular marker in the blood. And in fact, cholesterol is a, an essential vital nutrient in the body. It's a very strong healing agent. And people see cholesterol as this, as this villain after, you know, that's what I named my book is cholesterol, the real villain. And they think of cholesterol as this fat that's floating through the blood and clogging up the arteries. And that's really not what cholesterol does. And, you know, we talk in conventional medicine, they talk about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And I'm here to say that there's no such thing. Cholesterol is cholesterol. It's all the same. And, you know, when we talk about the different particles that, you know, so cholesterol is a fat in the blood and it needs to be transported. And so there's two transport mechanisms. One's called HDL, one's called LDL. So HDL stands for high density lipoprotein. LDL is low density lipoprotein. And so basically cholesterol has to be transported in the blood by a protein. Okay. And there's different types. LDL cholesterol is produced in the liver. It's sent out to your tissues to get dropped off, to be utilized, to make hormones, regulate the immune system. We need it for to make cell membranes. Um, we, it's a healing agent. We need it to heal cells in the body. So very, very, very important. And so sometimes when we ship that cholesterol out to our tissues, there's a little extra left over. And that, so no problem. Our liver sends out another little bus out there to pick up the excess cholesterol and bring it back to the liver. That's considered HDL cholesterol. So they kind of confuse it. They say, okay, well, you know, the one that's picking up and bringing it back to the liver, that's good. But the one that's bringing it out to the tissues, that's bad. Um, doesn't really jive. Okay? okay. So there's no, there's no good or bad. They're both the same. It's just how the transport is working. Now, the big thing with cholesterol is this, is that it's not so much about the quantity of cholesterol that we're concerned about, but more or less the quality. Now, what does that mean? Well, cholesterol can cholesterol particles, which is basically a protein with cholesterol in its core, can come in different sizes and shapes. And there's certain things that will dictate the size and shape of that cholesterol molecule. And the biggest, the biggest contributor to that, to the size and shape is someone's diet. If someone is eating a diet that's high in sugar, carbohydrates, or starchy foods, what ends up happening is the body will, in, in its, you take in more carbohydrates than what your body's able to burn or utilize, it's considered excess. So your liver actually transforms cholesterol, uh, uh, carbohydrates or glucose over to cholesterol and over to something called a triglyceride. But when this process happens and we have high amounts of sugar, high amounts of carbohydrates that our bodies are unable to burn or utilize, we start making these fats, but they are now they're, they're transported in these small little dense particles. And these small little dense particles have a greater likelihood of lodging in your artery wall. Okay, so in my book, I talk about how 
um, cholesterol can become a problem when it becomes oxidized or damaged. Okay, so this is a really important thing to talk about. In our bodies, we make on a daily basis something called free radicals. Okay, um, free radicals are reactive oxygen species that just develop in our body. And our body actually uses some of these free radicals to neutralize bacteria and toxins and so forth. But sometimes those free radicals can get out of control. Okay. And where else do we get free radicals? Well, if someone's a smoker, if they're eating a poor diet, uh, pollution, toxins, medications, and so forth can all form these reactive oxygen species. Luckily, in our body, we have something called antioxidants. Okay. We've all heard of antioxidants vitamin C, vitamin E, um, uh, selenium, these are all antioxidants and they're found in our, in our diet and we can also take them as a dietary supplement. Our body also makes a master antioxidant called glutathione. And we're gonna talk a lot about glutathione because that was kind of the whole premise behind my whole book. Now, um, do normal blood tests that are ordinarily um, prescribed or recommended for people, do they show the antioxidants or they only show levels of HG? You can Well, there's, you, you have to run specific testing to look for that. So the problem arises when you go to your conventional doctor, a lot of times they will solely run a lipid panel, which will look at the quantity of cholesterol in the blood. And they'll look at the breakdown, the HDL, the LDL and so forth. And if they see that quantity above a certain level, what they end up doing is they say, okay, well, we got to bring that down, okay? And the whole premise behind bringing it down is I, I understand where they're coming from, but we'll get to that in a minute. Let me just, let me backtrack a second here. So back to your question, there are tests that can be done through the conventional blood work that can identify ones, what's called oxidative stress their balance between their antioxidants and their free radicals, okay? And so this master antioxidant called glutathione can get, can, when it gets depleted, what ends up happening is that we have more free radicals and then cholesterol, which is a fat, can become damaged or oxidized from those free radicals. And when we have damaged cholesterol, it's useless. Your body can't use it to make hormones, replenish the nervous system, make cell membranes, it's garbage. One of the key components of cholesterol is if you have damage in your arteries due to inflammation, due to an insult, your body will actually send cholesterol to that area to heal. But if that cholesterol is oxidized or damaged due to excessive free radicals, it's useless, okay? So in conventional medicine, they kind of know this. They know that cholesterol, damaged cholesterol, oxidized cholesterol, is primarily the culprit, but in conventional medicine, there's no drug that works as an antioxidant. An antioxidant is a nutrient that we get from our diet, we get from dietary supplements and so forth. So the problem arises here is that in conventional medicine, they figure, okay, well, we'll just lower the quantity so there's less cholesterol to become damaged. I mean, that's one way of thinking about it, but why not leave the cholesterol alone because it's necessary in your body and do things to protect it by increasing antioxidant levels, in particular, this one master antioxidant, glutathione. Okay. So are there like studies that show that this has really been of benefit? And well, we there's, a, there's a lot of research out there showing that, um, when you have markers of high oxidative stress in the blood, and we'll discuss a couple of the ones that I look at in my practice with patients that indicate um, high free radicals in the blood. And we can look at those numbers and there's things that we can do to improve them. Okay. So conventional doctors, they just worry about that number, that cholesterol number. Okay. Let's, let's get it down. Okay. But in all actuality, you're not really, you're doing the person a great disservice because by lowering cholesterol that's necessary to make things in the body, just in an attempt to prevent it from becoming, you know, lowering the amount so there's less to be damaged, you're in turn lowering the quantity of this natural healing agent that the body needs, okay? So 
in my practice, what I'll do is I always run, I check to see what someone's cholesterol level looks like, okay? But I go one step further. I take a look and I see, okay, what's the size and shape of these cholesterol particles? Are they small, little dense ones that are more likely to become oxidized or damaged and get lodged in that artery wall because they can slip through the cracks a little easier? Or are they large, buoyant, fluffy particles, okay? And what designates what, what, you, what you can do dietarily to change that size and shape is watching your carbohydrate intake, essentially. You know, cholesterol gets this bad rap. And from a dietary perspective, people think, okay, well, I have high cholesterol, so I'm going to cut fat out of my diet. Right. I'm going to cut cholesterol out of my diet. Well, I'm here to tell you that only 25% of the cholesterol found in your blood comes from cholesterol found in your diet around 75 to 80% of the cholesterol in your blood is actually manufactured in your liver when you take in more sugar, carbohydrates, or starches than what your body can produce, can, can burn or utilize. Okay, so wow. taking too many carbs, your body actually get, tries to get rid of it by turning it into a fat. Well, cholesterol is a fat, and we have something called triglycerides, which are another type of fat that our body can burn as a fuel or if we don't burn it fast enough, it gets deposited and stored as body fat. So we have had this sort of tunnel vision look or understanding of cholesterol. Big time. Yeah, big time where it's been so demonized because, you know, in conventional medicine, when you think about it, okay, they have a test, it shows a number and that number should be within this range. And if it's outside that range, no worries. We have a drug that will bring it down into that range. And when you really look at the research out there, Half the people that suffer heart attacks have normal to low cholesterol levels. So solely looking at cholesterol quantity by itself is, is, not, a, is not a good marker for cardiovascular disease. It's not an independent marker. So there's, I find that a greater marker for cardiovascular disease is to measure one's oxidative stress. And in my book, I discuss a very inexpensive test that can be run by anyone's physician. The name of the test is called GGT. It's actually a liver enzyme test. And most doctors are very aware of this test. In fact, um, they'll use it in, in traditional medicine, and I use it too, to identify how someone's liver is functioning. We also use it um, to monitor if someone's um, an alcoholic you're gonna see those levels go up a lot. So if we're monitoring if someone's drinking or not, if someone's an alcoholic and we're trying to reform them and whatnot, if that level's high, we can assume that they're probably still drinking. But what happens is GGT is a direct marker for your glutathione status, okay? It's an enzyme that your, all your cells need to produce this master antioxidant called glutathione. And so, when we see high levels of GGT in the blood, that's an indication that you're depleted of your glutathione. So you have more of these free radicals ready to damage your cholesterol. And once again, damaged cholesterol has no use in the body. And when it tries to go heal an arterial, arterial insult, instead of it healing it up nicely, it deposits in like a gar garbage in a garbage can, deposits it in, into the artery wall. So this GGT marker becomes a very, very important um, marker, blood marker to look at in conjunction with a lot of the other markers. We can go one step further, and I don't really talk about this in the book, but there, we can actually ident we can also do a marker for oxidized LDL cholesterol. How much of the cholesterol is oxidized or damaged? So the GGT tells us a little bit about your, your glutathione or antioxidant status, the oxidized LDL marker tells me how much of that cholesterol is, is potentially damaged. And is it kind of um, atypical in medicine, not naturopathic medicine, to look at the liver when there's high cholesterol? Because I've never heard those really aligned. Well, the liver, that so that's a good, good, excellent question. So the liver is responsible for forming cholesterol, okay? That's where cholesterol is, is produced. And in fact, the drugs that are used to lower cholesterol, they work by poisoning the liver's ability, an enzyme in the liver that's responsible for forming cholesterol. That's how the drugs work. So the liver is an extremely important organ in the body. It's, it's responsible for detoxification in your liver cells. That's one of the main areas where we produce this master antioxidant called glutathione. 
And so most doctors, when they have patients on these cholesterol lowering drugs, they will monitor these liver enzymes. So think of it this, it's, it's, so, it's so absurd when you really think about it. The cholesterol lowering drugs have a negative impact on your liver, which can raise your liver enzymes, in particular, your GGT levels. Now I just said elevated GGT levels indicate a depleted level of glutathione, which protects the cholesterol from becoming damaged. You see where I'm going with this. It's, yeah, that, it's more than absurd. It's um, alarming. <laughs> it's backwards. I mean, one step further from there, you know, um, when I mentioned what cholesterol is used for, you need cholesterol to make hormones. In men, you need it to make testosterone. In women, you need it to make estrogen and progesterone. In both sexes, we need it to make uh, um, cortisol, which is our stress hormone. Well, Improper levels of hormones can be an Im can impact your cardiovascular system. So if you're depleting someone's level of cholesterol in an attempt to improve their cardiovascular health, but you're secondarily lowering their their levels of their hormones, you're actually you know you're trying to improve their overall cardiovascular health, but in the long run you're actually weakening it, we making it worse. Yeah. And that's why a lot of the, the research on these drugs show that they don't really have good clinical outcomes. A lot of the research that's been done on cholesterol lowering drugs are done on men that had a previous heart attack, that had pre existing conditions, they're smokers and whatnot. There's really not a lot of research out there showing that cholesterol drugs are a good thing for women. In fact, the research out there shows that in postmenopausal women, that are given these drugs, it increases their risk of becoming a diabetic by about 50%. So you're swapping one problem for another problem. I know that's a that's shocking statement, but there's a lot of research out there. And the whole premise behind it is kind of this. You have a liv your liver. When you have excess glucose, carbohydrates, it gets sent to your liver. Your liver will transform that glucose over to cholesterol and over to triglycerides, okay? And your doctor will see this and may say, okay, well, your cholesterol is high. So we're going to give you a drug that's going to poison the liver's ability. And they're not going to say poison, but I'm saying it. <laughs> we're going to poison your liver's ability to, to form cholesterol. So what happens is you have sugar going in one door of the liver and out the other door comes the cholesterol. Now we're going to block the liver's production of cholesterol. So we still have sugar over here. So what ends up happening is cholesterol goes down on this side, sugar goes up on this side because it has no place to go now. So when you apply this to certain people, men and women, but we're finding that in the research that it affects women more so, especially postmenopausal women, that we're finding that in long-term studies that the women that are put on these drugs have a 50% increased risk of becoming a diabetic, a substantial increase in their blood sugar because you know the liver is not working. So now here's the sugar going up. Yeah, the cholesterol is going down. So you're basically swapping one problem for another now. Okay. The other thing is, is that when we talk about hormones, one hormone in particular, which is testosterone for men. So we're talking about men now. Um, low testosterone is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, meaning you could have perfect blood sugar, perfect cholesterol, perfect um, everything. But if you have low testosterone as a man, you are at a, a significant increased risk of a cardiovascular event. And where do you get uh, testosterone from? Well, you need cholesterol to form testosterone. You see where I'm coming from? Oh, so the ankle bone really like, is connected to the knee bone. As in everything's that. connected, Joyce. You know, it's like when you really think about it, and that's one of the biggest problems that I see in conventional medicine today is that, you know, you have the primary care doctor, which is kind of like the gatekeeper. He, you know, he'll run all the basic tests and check you out in, in his five minutes that he spends with you. And if he finds that there's a problem, he'll refer you out to this specialist, this specialist, this specialist. So before you know it, this person's going to three or four different specialists. It's focusing on one area of the body when it's all interconnected. So a patient may go to their the, the doctor and find that they have high cholesterol. Okay, no problem. We'll send you the cardiologist, they'll work you up and we'll put you on a cholesterol lowering drug. 
now that patient comes back to the doctor and says, wow, my, my sex drive is down and I have, I'm losing uh, lean body mass. Okay, we'll run some testosterone levels on you. Wow, your testosterone is really low. We'll send you to an endocrinologist now. We'll keep you on the cholesterol drug though, because we want to protect your heart. So we go to the we go to the endocrinologist. He'll put you on a on a testosterone replacement, or do this, or do that. And before you know it, you went from being on zero medications to three or four, and each one is ne is necessary to offset the ill effects of the previous one. One huge thing missing in all of this is education. Education. You educate your patients, both with this ebook, which is so beautifully organized and, and easy to read and understand, but your patients get educated on the whys and the hows. That's enormous. Well, that's a big part of it, Joyce. You know, it's like a patient comes in and you know a lot of the a lot of them are misinformed from whatever they, they're learning on their own, but a lot of them are misinformed by their conventional doctor or, or only told, told half the story. Because, you know, when I see a patient, I spend, in some instances, up to an hour with them, ed, in, in primarily educating, talking like how you and I are talking, kind of breaking it all down for them. You know, um, I just had a, a patient come to see me who had went to their primary care doctor for their yearly physical. And she said, it was amazing. This guy spent like six minutes with me. His head was down. He's typing away. And I was only able to talk about one or one or two things. If I started to drift off and talk about other, other problems, they said, okay, well, you, we can't talk about that now. You're going to have to come back for another visit because we can only address one thing at a time. Well, everything's all connected. You know, we, and so, and that's the problem that we're seeing in, 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 you know, in the next video that we do, we're going to talk a little bit more about this too. You know, the next time we talk, um, we're going to kind of differentiate between how, how my type of medicine, naturopathic medicine and conventional and do a lot of comparing and contrasting, but that's what we're seeing in, in t today's day and age. And we, you know, these doctors are kind of hands, hand, you know, hamstrung because they, are only they're 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 taught to almost just follow these protocol and algorithms when they see a patient run blood work you see a number here you give this that's it you know there's no discussion about diet there's no discussion about lifestyle and if there is it's really rudimentary you know information you need to lose weight well how do i do that well eat less and exercise more okay thank you so yeah, much yeah i wish i had thought of that you know yeah <laughs> i mean yeah. so this is you know in in these are supposed to be the people that are in charge of your health and you know the way that they look at it is okay well in conventional medicine a lot of times they look at it is an absence of symptoms equals good health but there's that's so far from the truth I can band-aid all of a person's symptoms. That doesn't make them healthy. It just makes them asymptomatic, you know? And the symptoms, all that they are is your body telling you that there's a problem, you know? You know, I know what kind of a naturopathic physician you are. I know your reputation. Um, I've gone to you many times. I wish I could clone you and one of you see patients, but one of you be an educator because- yeah you do that so beautifully and so well. And that's kind of just selfish on my part that I wish everybody could hear what you're saying. And there's so many aha things in that for people who, you know, maybe are new to thinking about their health and people who are conscientious about their health, but have been either misinformed, misled Absolutely. or whatever. But we actually have about a minute, maybe two left. And I want to just totally leave the ball in your court with one promise that you're going to come back for another show. And we've already booked that. Yeah, but, we already talked about it. Yeah. And actually two promises. Anytime you do something that you think is worthy, not worthy, it's all worthy, but should be shared and you're willing to share, reach out to me and I promise you time. Oh, absolutely. I absolutely. Think, yeah. yeah. I think that's the biggest thing is that, you know, the misinformation, you know, we talk about misinformation all the time. And a lot of the mainstream stuff that's being put out there is half truths and a lot of misinformation. And it's, and when you really look at it and you kind of follow it, you just follow the money.
because that's really where it ends up going. It's like you yeah. can't make money off of something that's natural, like an antioxidant, um, you know, good, you know, good foods and stuff like that. But you can make a ton of money off of surgeries and drugs and so forth. So um, we'll talk in our next time about how to take back your health, really. But I, I wanted to get this information out there. And, um, you know, if, if anyone has any other, you know, wants to learn a little bit more about what we're talking about, they can always go to my website, too. And I can give you that and we can. Okay. At, when we um, and we're just about ready to close, yeah. but I'll make sure that all your contact info Absolutely. is um, typed in so that people can see it and, yeah. and reach out to you. But thank you so much for once again sharing your tremendous knowledge and passion Absolutely. with us i appreciate it and thank you to our viewers for joining us on the sacred journey we'll catch you next time warm at Jaws Pond and we're stocked full of treasures. Big or small, we buy it all. We buy and sell fast rides, power tools, vintage guitars, and so much more. Walk the plank in style with our fine jewelry, diamonds, and watches. Plus, we have a huge selection of the latest video games, including the new PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. Jaws Pond, conveniently located on Meriden Waterbury Turnpike in Southington and West Main Street in New Britain.